Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Harkins. I am the Events Associate for the French American Chamber of Commerce, New York Chapter, and we're happy to welcome you to our session today, The Hidden Paradox, Economic Discrimination and COVID-19. Just a very quick word about our organization. The French American Chamber of Commerce's mission is to provide the opportunities, experiences, and understanding that empower successful business relationships between and for members. The FACC New York Chapter counts a mosaic with 1,000 members, representing sectors from tech to food, finance, and other professional services. Now, just some housekeeping items. This uh, webinar will last around 30 minutes with 20 minutes or so of presentation, followed by 10 minutes for any questions that come our way. Um, as always, this webinar recording and slides will be available after the webinar. Now, a bit about our speaker today. Joining us is Pierre-André Chiapori. Mr. Chiapori is the E. Rowan and Barbara Stein Schneider Professor of Economics at Columbia University. His research focuses on household behavior, risk, insurance, and contract theory, general equilibrium, and mathematical economics. He is a fellow of the European Economic Association and of the Econo Econometric Society. Chiapori is also a member of the Institut de France and is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I won't keep us any, any keep us waiting any longer, Mr. Shiapori. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I'll let you begin. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be to be here for this uh, for this presentation. Uh, in the title, uh, there is this notion of a paradox. Uh, the starting point would be uh, the kind of next slide uh, would be the the series of very violent protests that took place in, in various American cities. Uh, and of course, there was a triggering event, which was the death of George Floyd. Uh, and this was a very tragic uh, event, probably a totally unacceptable one. Uh, but it's not the first time that uh, a black a person is killed by the police in the US. And, and sadly, it's certainly not the last time uh, so the, the question is, why is it that this particular event, tragic uh, as it may be, did trigger those kind of very violent protests? And there is an obvious uh, answer to that. Next slide, uh, which is which is an obvious one, but but which is also to a large extent the, the correct one, which is uh, the huge amount of tension and frustration that was generated by the the COVID pandemic. Uh, and that was hard for everyone, but the minorities have been hit especially hard, both by the disease itself um, in Chicago, which is a country, a, a city that I know well, the probability of uh, dying from the corona was about five times as large if you were a black man as if you were a white man. Uh, and there was various reasons uh, for that. It, nothing has to do with racism per se. Uh, but it was linked to the fact that uh, minorities, not only Afro-American, but, but also Hispanics, were more likely to be frontline workers, had a hard time implementing the kind of social distancing measures for various reasons. They were more likely to take uh, transportation um, and, and so on. And uh, also they were also uh, more vulnerable to the COVID because of their comorbidities. On the top of this, the economic crisis have, have hit uh, especially hard minorities. There have been lots of jobs that have been lost, uh, but especially the, the, the percentage of job loss for the minorities has much, much higher. Now, here comes the paradox. I don't think that this aspect has anything to do with race, but it has to do definitely with economics. If you, uh, there has been a recent study looking at the impact of the COVID over the last two months. Uh, over the first two months of the pandemic, so between mid-February and uh, mid-April. And what you see is there has been a, a very strong decline in employment, but this decline differs a lot by wage. And if you rank wage by, uh, by quartile, uh, next slide, you see that in the top quartile, the in unemployment has declined by about uh, eight, nine percent. Uh, all those numbers uh, are a bit pessimistic because since then there's been a recovery. That was the, the worst moment of the pandemic. But what you see is that people at the bottom, actually those, those are uh, quintiles, at the bottom the decrease has been minus 35%. And what happens here is that minorities are much 
overrepresented in this bottom quintile. So the kind of the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that my perception, and this is supported by a lot of empirical work, is that despite the, the apparent racial nature of the protest, uh, racism as such has declined, and I, I would argue significantly declined in the US over the last 50 years. Uh, indeed, uh, for instance, one thing that's very striking with the protest is that most a uh, large number of the protesters, in, in some cases, most of the protesters were white, which is definitely not what you would have seen in the in the 60s. Uh, there are some kind of firms like Gallup that run surveys about people's opinion, uh, and they ask questions, they used to ask questions about racism. The typical question was, what do you think about mixed marriages? And back in the 60s and the early 70s, lots of people were feeling uncomfortable with mixed marriages. Some people were even arguing that, uh, that uh, the mixed, mixed race marriage it should be forbidden. Uh, now they don't even ask the question anymore because the, the, essentially no one will object, uh, would object mixed marriages. So uh, the, I, my perception is that there has been a, a decline in racial discrimination in the US, there's, there's still, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to deny that there, there, are still race, there is still racism in the, the US society, but much less than in the past. However, economic discrimination, and in particular, the gap between the people at the bottom of, of uh, the, the income distribution and the top has increased. Uh, and I will argue that uh, the main difference here, now, I'm going to talk about inequality. I'm not going to uh, talk as Piketty says and other people do. I'm not going to talk about the absolute top of the distribution, the top 1% or the top 0.1%. Uh, as you know, uh, Piketty and his co-author have been uh, working a lot and, and showing in a sort of convincing way that uh, the percentage uh, of uh, total income going to the top 1% has increased, although there are some debates about this. Uh, that's not my topic here. I will uh, mostly talk about the bottom of the distribution and what I see as the main uh, dividing criterion regarding inequality, which is human capital. So essentially, I'm going to talk about various dimensions of human capital, but essentially education. Uh, so what I want to, to talk about uh, now is the link between uh, inequality, education or in capital in general, and social mobility. Uh, there is a no myth, which is that USA is a land of opportunity. And uh, there, of course, there is a lot of inequality at any given moment, but that's the price to pay to have a very mobile society, a society in which you can start at the bottom and you can make it to the top, or at least your children can make it to the top. And I will try to convince you that this is a myth, that it might have been true at the beginning of the 20th century, but this has not been true for a very long time. Next slide. So I'm not going to argue, actually. I'm just going to show you some facts, and then we can start the discussion. The first fact will be the evolution uh, since the last 70. The second fact, next slide, would be uh, the, the fact that human capital, uh, and in particular education, has been a key factor. If you want to understand the evolution of inequality in the US for the last five decades, you cannot ignore human capital. That's really the the key role played by human capital in this evolution. Uh, third fact, next slide. Yes, how do we explain uh, this evolution? And here I will do baby basic economic supply and demand, and you will see that it goes a long way explaining what's going on. Uh, the following fact, next slide, is uh, I will talk about social mobility and what's called the Great Gatsby curve. Next slide. So I'm starting with data. So what you have here is the evolution of real family income in, uh, during the period that French people called the Trente Glorieuses, the, the Glorious 30, which is the, 30, uh, the three decades right after the war. Uh, I'm not interested in levels. I'm interested in evolution. So the benchmark is all those series are 100 in 1973. And you may not see it, but there are three curves here. 
uh, top of the distribution, middle of the income distribution, and bottom of the income distribution. Now, there are two things remarkable about this evolution. First of all, this huge increase between 1949 and 1973, uh, real income doubles. And you know, there are not so many examples in the, in the economic history of the world in which you have such a growth in such a small period. But even more remarkable is that you basically see only one curve. Those two curves are exactly coincide, which means that this huge growth has benefited everybody basically to the same extent. Next slide. When you look at what's going on afterwards, the story is completely different. You see basically the same growth for the top of the distribution, the top 5%, uh, but for the median and the lower income, things are completely different. And you see this huge diffraction, which is exactly what I want to talk about. Now, those data, you have to be careful with those kind of data. What The way you, you, you do that is that you take the population at any given moment and uh, you look at the distribution of income. That's not satisfactory for, that could be actually misleading for two reasons. One is, if you're using current income, uh, part of this income is just due to an income shock that's transitory. So, so, you know, some people have a good year and then a bad year, and uh, sometimes they will be uh, higher in the distribution, sometimes they're lower in the distribution. That's not exactly inequality. It's more like randomness. And actually, if you look at uh, consumption instead of income, consumption is much smoother. So that because people uh, dissave uh, when they are when they hit by a negative shock and, and save more when they hit by a positive shock. And the second thing is, we would like to be to look at the, the trend, what Milton Friedman called the permanent income, the permanent component of the income growth. But there is an income growth. Uh, and in particular, uh, for any individual, for most individuals, uh, the income is growing throughout time, uh, throughout their career. So they end up as a much higher level than when they started. And again, this is perceived that those kind of numbers as inequality, whereas in fact, is more, it, it, it's more the natural uh, logic, the natural dynamics of an economic career. What you would like to do is take people at the, at the beginning of their career, say the age 25, and then have an idea of the total income that they're going to receive throughout their life. And we can do that in the US because we have this wonderful data set, which is called the, the PSID, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, uh, which follows thousands, actually tens of thousands of Americans over uh, in, 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 um, in a panel, uh, with a panel structure. So over time, and this, this uh, data have been around for more than half a century. Next slide. Now that's uh, something that uh, is done was done in, in, a, even, um, in a recent study by uh, Fatih Guvnen and other co-authors. So let me say you a few words about the, the graph that you have on the left hand side. That's for men. Uh, look at the first number, which is uh, someone we are we starting in 1955. So think of someone who was was born in 1930 and uh, is 25 in 1955, this gives you the, the total income that this person will perceive throughout this time, of course, discounted. Uh, and this is done for various levels, the, the bottom 10%, the, the bottom 25%, the median and the, the top 75% and the top 90%. So in particular, one thing you can look at here is if I look at the people born in 1940 and uh, were 20, uh, 25 in 1965, and then you look at the next generation, the people who were born 20 years later in 1960 and who were 25 in 1985, to what extent is the new generation doing better than the, the previous one? And you see that the answer is positive only for the top of the distribution. If you look at the, even at the black line, which is the, the top 25%, uh, essentially it's flat. And for everybody else, it's in fact slightly declining. So the US economy has been growing over this period, not as fast as uh, just after war, but you know, in per capita term, it has been growing at something between uh, uh, 1.5 and 2.5% on average. Uh, but we see that this benefit, this gain coming from this growth has been concentrated on the top of the distribution and has basically not benefited people at the bottom. 
On the right hand side, you got women and women is a completely different story. I'll come back to that. Next slide, please. The main explanation for this huge difference is, as I said, human capital. In particular, it's always been important to be educated, in particular to have a bachelor degree, but it's much more important now than used to be the case in the past. Now, the numbers you have here are the, what we call the college premium. So you, you take the average wage of a person uh, with a college degree and you divide that by the average wage of a person with a high school degree. And if you do that in the in 72, the difference is 22%, which is not negligible. It means that those people are gonna make 22% uh, uh, higher income year after year throughout their career. Uh, but yet it's not huge. If you look at 2012, the difference is 70%. So from 22% to 70%, the college premium has basically tripled over the period. Uh, you, for women on the right hand side, it's less spectacular, but you will still see that the college premium has doubled. So, as I said, despite the fact that it was always good to be educated, being educated makes much more of a difference now than it used to uh, 50 years ago. How can we explain that? So that's my supply and demand story. You know, when you're an economist, you believe in supply and demand as Econ 101. So next slide. This is, oh yes, this is the same in value. Oh, yeah, let me just say a few words about this graph here. This is the, the benefit in dollars that you get over your lifetime from getting a college education as opposed to a high school degree. Note that this is net of tuition and we know that tuition have increased a lot. Uh, yet what we see is that the, the value for men are more than doubled, actually almost tripled. Uh, and uh, it has uh, more, it has also tripled for, for women. So I hear from time to time that uh, education, that upper education is too expensive. Well, even though the cost has been going up big time, it's still an incredibly profitable investment. The returns on this investment are huge. Next slide, please. I was talking about income. But this is a completely different dimension, which is also quite spectacular. Uh, my uh, colleagues and friends, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, were the first to point out about 10 years ago that the US was the only developed country in which uh, life expectancy has been declining for several years in a row. Uh, and they were explaining that this is due to a, a huge increase in what they call death of despairs, which is drug related alcohol-related or suicide. Those graphs give you the evolution over, uh, over the last uh, three decades by age, by age range, so each diagram corresponds to an age range, but also by education. The educated people are in blue and the less educated people are in red. And you see that there is a decline in life expectancy uh, due to this uh, surge in uh, this death of despair. But this is essentially concentrated on the less educated people. We don't see it much, if anything, on the more educated people. So this, this distinction between educated, uh, more and less educated people is very visible on income, but not only. Next slide. This is a very interesting graph. This is due to David Otter from MIT. What he does is he takes all the jobs in the US. And actually, he wants to take into account the fact that some jobs are part-time, some jobs are full-time, and some are full-time plus overtime. So he takes the total number of hours worked in the US in a given year. And he has the following question, what fraction of those hours require a college degree? And what you see is that back in the in 64, it was less than 20%. Uh, in 2012, it was more than 50%. It's still increasing. The message I draw from this graph is the pro from the production side, there has been a huge increase in demand for educated, skilled people. Why that? I'm not going to. I'm not going into into this this question. Uh, that there have been huge debates on this. Let me mention at least two causes, uh, which which obviously have been important. One is technical progress. When you replace uh, a manual job with with uh, with a machine 
on the one hand, you're, dis you're destroying uh, unskilled job, but on the other hand, you create a job for the people who are going to design the machine, maintain it, repair it, and so on. But the, the job you create are much more likely to be skilled to require an education. And the second potential culprit would be international trade. Many of those low-skilled jobs have been outsourced. There are some debates about the respective importance of those factors and others. But anyway, the message here is on the demand side, you have a huge increase uh, in the demand for skilled work. What about supply? That's the next slide. So what we did here is we take each year over the, the age range that you can see, we take the population age 30 and 40, and we ask ourselves what fraction of this population has some college, which is essentially you know, junior college uh, two years after high school, that will be the solid line, a college degree, which will be the dashed line, or a grad degree, uh, PhD, MD, law degree, MBA, whatever, that will be the dotted line. And women are in red and men are in blue. So the first thing that's, that's obvious, and that, by, by the way, that's, that's true not only in the US, but in, in basically all developed countries, women are more educated than men now. Uh, and, and that has been going on everywhere. But there is a second point, which is even more fascinating, which is uh, represented by the red rectangle that you can see at the, at the bottom of the graph. This is exactly the period over which the college premium, and even more the college plus premium, has been exploding. So the, over that period, returns to investment in education have increased a lot, and you would expect people to respond to that by investing more into education. And you see that big time for women. The percentage of women with uh, top education has increased from 4% to 11 12% now, which is you know, a factor of three. Again, that's very uncommon. Uh, that's, that's a huge change. Even more surprising is the fact that for men, you don't see anything. If anything, you see a small, uh, a slight decline. So in other words, there has been an increase in supply of skilled work, but by the, the supply has by no means followed demand, which simply means that the price of skilled work has been going up. Next slide, please. Now, I'm gonna finally talk about social mobility uh, and what's, what's called the uh, Great Gavi Curve. So on this curve, let me just explain you what I'm gonna put on this curve. Actually, I should not say I, because this curve was created by uh, my, uh, my, my friend, the late Alan Kruger, uh, and he coined the name um, Great Gatsby Curve. On the, uh, I'm gonna put different countries on this graph. And on the horizontal axis, I'm gonna rank them by income inequality. So the country to the right will be country in which the inequality at any given moment is very high, whereas the, the more equal country will be to the left. On the vertical axis, I'm gonna put social mobility or more precisely, I'm going to put the way we economists uh, observe or quantify social mobility, which is what we call uh, generational earning elasticity. So in a nutshell, uh, the question is, if I know the income of the parents, how much does it tell me about the income of the children? And in a very mobile society, not much. So we will have an index of 0.1 or 0.2. In a very rigid society, if I, the, the index will be 0.5, meaning that if I know the income of the parents, I basically uh, know 50% of what I need to know about the income of the, of the children. The point here is that uh, the higher up a country is on this scale, the less socially mo mobile, and in particular intergenerationally mobile it is. Before showing you the graph, just let's ask ourselves what we what would we like this graph to look like. And my claim is we would love this graph to be decreasing. And that's exactly what I called uh, uh, earlier the American myth. We would like the idea that the, uh, the US is a country which is to the right, meaning that there is a lot of inequality, but that the price to pay for social mobility and intergenerational mobility, meaning that the, the inequal country or mobile country and they are at the bottom right, Whereas there are some countries which are much less unequal, but in which there is less social mobility, and those countries will be at the top left. So we would like to see a graph which is decreasing. Next slide. That's the real graph. 
And what you see is exactly the opposite. The countries in which there is the, uh, the maximum level of inequality at any given moment are also the countries in which there is the smallest level of intergenerational mobility. Uh, those are the United States and United Kingdom and Italy, but Italy is a completely different story. There are some lens of opportunities, but it's not the United States. It's New Zealand, it's Canada, it's Australia. A uh, lot of inequality, although less than in the United States, but a lot of mobility. And of course, the champions of both equality and mobility are Northern European countries. I'm going to finish my talk on the next, on the on the last graph. Uh, I'm going to keep exactly the same scale on the vertical axis, but on the horizontal axis, I'm, I'm putting the college premium. Uh, so how important is it in terms of your future wage to have a college degree? And that's the, it's positive for all countries, but it's not as important in all countries. And what you see is that it's the countries in which college matters, uh, education, uh, university education matters most are exactly the countries in which social mobility is the smallest. Uh, and that simply means that the way inequality is transmitted is mostly through education. Uh, educated people tend to marry each other. They tend to invest a lot in the education of their children, which means that there is a lot of inequality for the next generation. Next slide, please. So let me just conclude. And what my concern here is that there might be something that I would like to call an inequality spiral. Uh, human capital is more crucial now than in the past. Next. The, can you put all of them now? All the slides, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, the high, uh, high human capital, uh, capital people are more likely to marry their own and to invest in their children, meaning that if you look at the inequality among uh, younger kids, there will be more inequality for the next generation than there was in the previous generation. Uh, and of course, there will be less uh, mobility. This is a very nasty mechanism because on the one hand, it's, you know, I, I have nothing against inequality to the extent that inequality provides incentive. The fact that a very successful businessman is making much more than an unsuccessful one uh, is not, it's not shocking. It gives exactly incentive to invest, to innovate, and economic growth need this kind of, of incentives. There is no doubt. But here, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inequality of opportunity. We're talking about the fact that uh, if you're unlucky enough to be born at the wrong place, and the wrong place could be geographical, could be family, in general, it's a, it's a mixture. It's like we tend to believe that it's mostly family. Well, the kind of opportunity in front of you are not the same. On the other hand, it's efficient. The fact that the top people invest a lot in their children is exactly what will give us uh, a, a new generation of, of super skilled, smart, creative people, which is exactly what the economy uh, grows. So we have in this kind of situation in which uh, what's good for actually essential for efficiency and growth is terrible in terms of inequality. So which kind of public policy, and this may sound uh, very pessimistic, there is still a light of hope, which is uh, all intervention. My colleague and friend, uh, uh, Jim Heckman, whom I consider as the probably the greatest economist alive, has worked a lot on this. And uh, his argument is, if we want to change inequality in the US, the best investment we can make is taking care of children at a very early age and invest a lot there. I've been slightly too long. Apologies for that. I'm done with my talk. No, no problem. Thank you so much, Mr. Shiapori. Um, you know, we have a couple minutes to answer some questions. Uh, so while we answer the first couple, I encourage the audience to send in any more. Um, Mr. Shiapori, the, the first question we really have is, besides, you know, I guess you just said investing in the youth, but other, way, other ways, how do we break this spiral? It's... Uh... This is structural. You know, there, when, when, when you have a surge in the, in the highest incomes, you can, you can try to tax or... or uh, here, what we have is a mechanism whereas educated people marry educated people and invest a lot of their kids, and they're going to do that. And they're going to do that because they love their kids. They're going to do that because it's economically efficient from their point of view. And they're going to do that as well. For, uh, and it's good. It's efficient also for the economy. We want very, very highly skilled people. We want innovators, we want that. Uh, so this will be extremely difficult to break. I believe that policy intervention can in some sometimes be successful in alleviating or correcting 
mistakes, uh, market failures. Uh, but it's very difficult for a policy to counter economic efficiency, to go against evolution which are economically efficient. Uh, the great thing with early intervention is that it's both efficient and uh, pro-equality. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the long run, now in the short run, we may, we may want to, for instance, to subsidize the wages or things like this. We, uh, we may want to, there, there, is this, there are those huge changes. There are people losing their jobs to technical progress. We want to help those people and they have been left aside, not only in the US, it's the same in France, it's the same in most developed countries. We may want to help them uh, when wage subsidies might be a way to do that. Okay. Um, and so I just, you know, what are your thoughts on millennials and Generation Z not making the decision to procreate? How does this affect the importance of human capital going forward? Well, uh, that, that was one of the, of the favorite uh, uh, theme of uh, another great friend of mine who unfortunately passed away uh, years ago, uh, Gary Baker. Uh, it, what, what he was mentioning is the, there is a trade-off between quality and quantity in terms of children. So what we, what we see over the last 50 years is a decline in fertility. Uh, but his explanation was uh, people have less children in numbers, but they invest much more uh, on their children in terms of uh, not only uh, money, but time, uh, effort, and so on and so forth. Now, this is supported by the data in particular. Let me just uh, mention one result that I find very surprising. Uh, we have time use data, so we know exactly uh, how, how much time people spend with their kids, and in particular, the kind of you know, intellectually stimulating activities. Uh, what we find is, A, educated people spend much more time with their kids than uneducated people, which is surprising because the value, the, the, the opportunity cost of their time is much higher, uh, yet they spend much more time, and they spend much more time with their kids now than uh, similarly educated people used to do back in the 60s, 70s, even, even the early 80s. Uh, so in a sense, the fact that people choose to have less, less children but invest a lot in their children is a good thing for growth in general. It's probably a bad thing in terms of future inequality. Mm -hmm. And would you say that population has a large importance in, on the points that you made? For social progress, does a country's social progress depend entirely on population? Not entirely, definitely not. I mean, it depends on, on innovation. The first factor for growth is innovation and the capacity to innovate. Now, the capacity to innovate is complex because it's not only that you need people coming with an idea or scientists coming with a patent, but you need a, a, a mechanism within the economy that allocates uh, resources, and in particular, that allocates capital in the most efficient way, which, by the way, is the reason why I'm much less afraid by China than most people are. Uh, the China, Chinese can be extremely efficient in the catching up phase, uh, because in, as, as any dictatorship, they can decide to take millions and hundreds of millions of people from the fields and send them to factories, and, and that's, that doesn't cause any social problem. But at the current level, what, what China will need more and more is an efficient way of allocating capital and giving capital to uh, either party members or, or public uh, or, of state firms is definitely not the way. Now, population. Population growth is important because you don't want the population to age too much. And the, the problem with, uh, but you know, the, the U.S. Is, doing, is not doing too bad. The U.S. is doing much better than many European countries. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, final question, good good place to end it. What resources would you suggest looking at to further educate uh, yourself on how to progress on inequality, economic efficiency, et cetera? Oh, well, in that case, uh, the very last two words on my slide are Ekman Equation. That's actually a website. So Google Ekman Equation and Jim Ekman has this uh, website in which he's explaining how, why, and to what extent we should uh, invest in early intervention. But I think that if there is one message from my talk, that would be the, the message. Well, Mr. Shiapuri, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I know we went over. So I thank the attendees uh, for staying with us and asking such great questions.
Um, I will just say, um, tune in to Friday where we have a, a very different topic, but we'll be making crafts with Chef Simon. Uh, so not exactly uh, economic discrimination, but it's interesting nonetheless. Mr. Shiopori. Oh, it's human uh, capital. It's definitely oh, it's, human yes. capital. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Shiopori, thank you so much for taking the time again, and um, really appreciate you being with us here and lending your insight into these uh, very important topics. You're most welcome. Everybody, take care. Um, have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.